Nick Freeman is a lawyer who specialises in defensive traffic and speeding cases. Good evening, Nick. Good evening. Nick, I'm not sure if you managed to hear what Chris Boardman had to say there, but does, does he have a point? Yeah. Is our attention in the wrong direction here? Well, he has an excellent point, um, and I completely agree with what he says, but uh, the conversation is moving and has always moved to try and make our roads safer so far as motorists are concerned. You know, we're now confronted um, with 20 mile an hour speed limits in many inner city city areas. We've now got cycle lanes at massive expense uh, that are being built. The infrastructure needs to continue. Um, The two arguments aren't mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I... I, I, my, my whole ethos is to try and make the roads safer for everybody. Um, and the, the the number of pedestrians and cyclists who are killed by motor vehicles is truly horrific. And the government um, and road safety campaigners are doing their best and by keeping the conversation moving to try and reduce that figure and that, that they are meeting with some success. I, I don't think that means that we shouldn't therefore discuss how we can make cycling safer as well for pedestrians and indeed for cyclists. Um, and to, to, to seriously suggest that, and I'm not sure this is Chris's point, that because there are very few people thankfully killed each year by cyclists, we shouldn't legislate for it. It, it's, it will be a little bit like saying, well, we, we don't have many cannibals. Mm-hmm. But when we do, they need to be punished. We need to li- you know, have legislation in place to deal with it. Um, sadly, there are far more people who are seriously injured every year by cyclists, pedestrians mainly. Um, uh, that figure is rising massively. I think it rose 22% in the last 12 months as we have more and more cyclists on the road. That that statistic is going to get more. And, and it must be right that we uphold the rule of law and create a rule of law that actually prioritizes number one in the vulnerability stakes, which is pedestrians. So when you have a situation now, we, very, very recently we had um, a peloton of cyclists racing around Regent's Park. That's that's quite a regular event, and I spend quite a bit of time in Regent's Park. You know, if you had car um, drivers racing, it's it's dangerous per se. Mm-hmm. They're likely to go to prison for it. Um, and yet we hear, well, the cyclists are racing. They're doing time trials. Um, that is that is dangerous per se. There was tragically a lady, seventy, an eighty-one year old lady who stepped out. Uh, and the cyclists were not prepared for it because they had their heads down. They were going in excess of the car speed limit, and she was killed. Obviously, the whole point in reducing speed limits for cars is if there is a collision, there will be less injury. That argument obviously applies to cyclists. There's no speed limit for cyclists at the moment. So what mm-hmm. what Sir Ian Duncan Smith has proposed, it's something that I've been pursuing with the government for many, many years, it is to bring in legislation to deal with the, the, the minority, the tiny minority of, of cyclists who actually cause serious harm to pedestrians. And what are we talking about there, Nick? What exactly do you mean by that? Are we talking about registration plates on bikes? Well, uh, well, I would like to see registration plates on bikes, but at the moment, for example, there's no speed limit, there isn't a drink drive limit, a drink cycling limit, there isn't a drug cycling limit, and if you cycle dangerously, the maximum fine is £2,500. Uh, if you kill someone, God forbid you cycle dangerously and kill someone, there isn't actually an offence for which you can be dealt. Manslaughter is very hard to prove, um, mm-hmm. and what what you know the, the case of Briggs, um, I think it was 2016, a tragic case, 2016, 2017 case. It was the the racing bike that shouldn't have, it had no brakes, it shouldn't have been on the road. He he, he was convicted um, under the Offences Against the Persons Act, 1861. Um, which was designed to deal with horses and carriages. Maximum sentence was two years. Is two years of that. That's maximum sentence. Um, And obviously, if you plead guilty, as he did, you get a third off um, for discount for pleading guilty. Mm -hmm. So it it has to be right, doesn't it, that if you are part of that tiny minority and you want to cycle dangerously and the consequences are that you kill or seriously injure, then there is a, a means of sentencing where you are going to be accountable. At the moment, there isn't. Uh, and all that's being proposed is now there will be. And I think you, in, in your introduction, you said it was 14 years. My understanding is um, that it's actually a life sentence. It's a parity, parity with motor vehicles. Um, but whatever, it's a significant sentence that wasn't there before. Uh, and I think that will act as a deterrent. It will make people think, if I'm cycling, I actually need to be aware. I need to cycle carefully. 
because if I'm cycling along by the on the road by the by the side of the pavement, I've got to observe are pedestrians going to step out because pedestrians do that, and you now have a responsibility, a legal responsibility. And you know, if you hit someone at 25 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour on a, on a bicycle because you're racing, you are going to cause serious damage to that person. And it may not be your fault that they stepped out, but it's your fault that you're going that fast. And the law will require you to assume responsibility. And you're looking at at custody. So yeah. that in itself will, in my view, make the roads and pavements safer for everyone. And th there's an additional point. Yeah. Um, you know, c can I just, just say this briefly? There must be tens of thousands of cyclists every day who go through red lights, who cycle on the pavements, and there's no means of bringing them to account because all you have is a cyclist cycling dangerously. Yeah. Um, and when you ask, do we bring in number plates, at least there is a system with cars whereby the driver, the register keeper is held to account currently with cyclists, unless they're detained or unless they stop, there is no means of holding them to account. And that's why I feel some form of registration plate, whether it be a tabard or a, a registration plate, as exists on cars, will actually, again, benefit the safety of our roads. And that's what we're all concerned about. Nick, may I raise the issue of grab-and-go bikes, electric bikes, and also scooters? I don't know if they yep. fall in the same category here, but well, there, there must be some form of registration there, surely. Um, but at the same no. time, would that discourage people from using those bikes, do you well, think? Well, for, 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 first of all, the, 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 there isn't the, are we talking about electric bikes? Are you yes. talking about yes. electric bikes? Yeah. At the moment, electric bikes are regarded as um, bicycles, as long as they're limited to 250 watts, um, their, their maximum speed according to the electric propulsion, is 15.5 miles per hour. Now, of course, they can be tweaked. And with pedal power, in addition to the electric power, they can go very quickly and they're very heavy and they cause damage. They're regarded as cyclists, as cycles, if they fall within that capacity, as long as they're not exceeding that capacity. So they would fall within the new legislation, the legislative proposals that are being uh, uh, suggested at the moment. If you tweak them and make them more powerful, they're regarded as a moped or a motorbike, and they are covered by the Road Traffic Act. And so they basically have the same, they're a motor vehicle, and they have the same legislative power, the same legislative control that exists for car drivers, van drivers, lorry drivers. So the law is already in situ. But there is the problem, how do you identify them? And it's the same at the moment with e-scooters. They're already covered by the Road Traffic Act. So there is a drink drive limit, there's speed limits, there, there are all the offences of causing death by dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't have a registration plate. So you have a crucial piece of the jigsaw that I'm afraid needs to be put in place to make the system fully accountable. If they're accountable, they're responsible, they'll drive more carefully, they'll cycle more carefully. Yes, it will deter some people. Um, you know, there, there are all sorts of things that deter people from driving. People don't want to wear safety belts. People don't want to pay, pay insurance, you know. Ultimately, if you want to cycle, you'll get your head around it and you'll say, this is a necessary part of what we need to do and we adapt. It's called progress. And if it makes the road safer for everyone, surely everyone should welcome it with open arms. Well, Nick Freeman, really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, a lawyer who specialises in defence of traffic and speeding cases. Thank you, Nick.